Ooh. Hello, everybody. We'll start in a minute or two. Any questions on anything before we begin? So just if you're keeping track, or maybe in case you're not keeping track, exam two is scheduled for Wednesday, November 24th, day before Thanksgiving. If you look at the syllabus, what we're up to now is lessons 17 and 18 on the mean value theorem and <clears throat> functions that are increasing and decreasing on the first derivative test. So let's just review a little bit and then I'll do some of the homework problems. So in section 4.2, <clears throat> there are two very beautiful theorems. One is Rolle's theorem, which is says if you have a function f of x, which is continuous on a closed interval from a to b and differentiable, on the open interval from A to B, if F of A equals F of B, then see what is the picture? Here's X equal A, here's X equal B, and here is this value, F of A equals F of B. The function takes on the same value at the endpoint of the interval. And Rolle's theorem says that there is at least one, it can be many more, at least one number C strictly between A and B where the derivative is zero. So for example, here, that's the value C where f prime of c is zero. In fact, in this graph, there are three such points where the derivative is zero. Uh, Rolle's theorem simply says there's always at least one. And the generalization of this is the mean value theorem. And what the mean value theorem says is, again, f of x is continuous on the interval from a to b, differentiable on the open interval from A to B. So this is X equal A, X equal B. But now we don't assume that the graph of the function, <clears throat> that the function takes on the same values at A and B. So this is on the graph and let's say this is B, F of B. And maybe the function looks like that. What the mean value theorem says is if you draw the chord from a f of a to a f of b, so that's a straight line, it has a slope, and there's a one at least one point c between a and b where the derivative of its c is equal to the slope of the tangent line. So again, f of x is continuous on the closed interval from A to B, differentiable in the open interval. And 
there is at least one number C between A and B such that F prime of C, <coughs> the slope of the tangent line to the curve at C is the slope of this chord or the secant line. And the slope of this line, it's just the formula for slope, F of B minus F of A over B minus A. <coughs> That's the mean value theorem. Are there any questions about that? Now, there's a very important relationship between the shape of a curve and the derivative. So we think of a function as increasing if its values get larger, f of x gets larger as x gets larger. Um, and that's the formal definition. So f is increasing on an interval. If for any two numbers, x1 and x2 in the interval implies that <coughs> f of x1 is less than f of x2. This is sometimes called strictly increasing, but our book is calling it increasing. And f is decreasing or strictly increasing if x1 less than x2 implies f of x1 is less than f of x2. So for example, if you have the parabola y equals x squared, looks like that. So this function f of x equals x squared is decreasing on the whole interval from minus infinity to zero. Because as you go to the right, the function gets smaller. And it's increasing on the interval from zero to plus infinity, because it's getting bigger. Once you get past zero, x1, x2, f of x2 is bigger than f of x1. <clears throat> and the test for increasing and decreasing functions is the following. If f of x prime of x is greater than zero for all x in the open interval from a to b, then f of x is increasing on the closed interval from a to b. And the proof is just the mean value theorem. So suppose this is a f of a and this is b f of b. We know there's some point c between a and b where f of b minus f of a over b minus a is f prime of c, which is greater than zero. So f of b minus f of a, <coughs> is greater than zero because b minus a is positive, b is bigger than a. So f of b is bigger than f of a. So if a is less than b, f of a is less than f of b, this function is increasing. And we can say the same for decreasing. Let me use x1 and x2 now as my letters. So I have x1 and x2, I have a and b, 
and I choose some x1 and x2 between a and b, x1 less than x2, x1 greater than or equal to a, x2 less than or equal to b. And whatever the graph of the function is, there's some c between x1 and x2 such that f of x2 minus f of x1 over x2 minus x1. That's the slope of this chord or secant line. It's f prime of c. And if f prime of c is always negative, f prime of x is always negative for all x between a and b, then f of x2 minus f of x1 is less than zero. f of x2 is less than f of x1. So as you go from x1 to x2, the function gets smaller and it is decreasing. So this is not really a good picture of this, but it's a generic picture. So recall that a critical number of a function f of x f of x on an interval is a number c such that either the derivative at c is zero or there is no derivative. The derivative does not exist at x equals c. Suppose you have a relative minimum of a function. That's a relative minimum. As you approach the relative minimum, the function is decreasing, the derivative is negative. When you go past the relative minimum, the function is increasing, the derivative is positive. If the derivative changes from negative to positive at a point x equals c, you have a relative minimum. So if the derivative changes from negative positive, you have a relative minimum. If you have a relative maximum, as you approach the max and you're increasing, the derivative is positive. Beyond the maximum, the derivative is negative. So you have a relative max if f prime of x changes from increasing to degree, decreasing from positive to negative. And that's the first derivative test. So, Let's just look at a couple of examples. So a relative extremum and the plural is extrema. This means a relative max or a relative min. And here's an example from the text, example four. Find the relative extrema of the function f of x equals x to the fourth plus one over x squared. This function is defined for all x except zero. So this is only defined for x different from zero. So we can simplify this slightly, x to the fourth 
plus one over x squared. This is x to the fourth over x squared plus one over x squared. That's x to the two plus x to the minus two. So the derivative is two x minus two x to the minus three, which is two x minus two over x cubed. Or if I put that over a common denominator, that's two x to the fourth over x cubed minus two over x cubed. So that's two x to the fourth minus two over x cubed. I can simplify that a little bit. That's two x to the fourth minus one. X to the fourth minus one factors into two x squared minus one x squared plus one. X squared minus one factors into x minus one x plus one x squared plus one over x cubed. So that's what my derivative is. What are the critical numbers? Well, this derivative is zero at x equal one and x equal minus one. And what is not in the domain of the function is x equals zero. So on the number line, we have minus one, zero, one. Let's look at the sign, positive or negative, of the derivative in these one, two, three, four, four intervals. So we have the interval from minus infinity to minus one, from minus one to zero, from zero to one, and from one to infinity. And in these intervals, the function is always defined, it's continuous, it's never zero. It's never zero, it can't cross from positive to negative. It's either always positive or always negative. So one way to determine the sign is just to pick a test value. So for example, suppose I pick as a test value in this interval, minus two. So what is the sign of the derivative at negative two. Here's the derivative. These are all the derivative. When x is negative two, negative, negative, positive, negative. So positive over negative is less than zero. Let me write it like this. f prime of minus two is less than zero. So in this interval, call this our conclusion, in the interval from minus infinity to minus one, the function is decreasing. In the interval from between minus one and zero, I'll take minus a half as my test value. When x is minus a half, let's see, minus a half, minus a half to the fourth, it's like a 16th, this is negative, this is negative. F prime of minus a half is positive. So in this interval, the function is increasing. From zero to one, I'll choose one half as my test value. 
what is the sine of f prime at a half? Well, a half cubed is positive, a half to the fourth, it's a sixteenth. This is negative. So the function is decreasing in this interval. And in the interval from one to infinity, I can choose two as a test value. When x is equal to two, f prime of two is positive, the function is increasing. The value at minus one <coughs> is two. Decreasing, increasing. The value at plus one is also two, decreasing, increasing. Graph of the function is going to look like this with a vertical asymptote at x equals zero. Hmm. That's kind of interesting. Any questions about this? Let's look at one more example. Again, I'll pick examples from the book, so it's easy to study these at home. This is example five. So a projectile is being propelled at an angle theta and its height as a function of its horizontal distance. So something is being thrown. And for every value of x, there's a height y. And we're told that the height y is given <coughs> by the following function of x. G secant squared theta over two V naught squared x squared plus tangent theta x plus h. So theta is the angle at which the projectile is initially thrown and v naught is its initial velocity. g is the acceleration due to gravity and h is the initial height. So we're given, we know that the acceleration due to gravity is minus 32 feet per second squared. We're told the initial velocity is 24 feet per second. The initial height from which we throw this projectile is nine feet. And the only variable is what angle you throw this projectile from. And the problem is to find theta to produce the maximum horizontal distance. So you're throwing this object and at some point it's going to hit the ground and you want to know where it hits the ground and where it hits the ground depends on the angle theta from the horizontal at which you throw the angle, throw this object. So what angle theta gives you the maximum distance traveled? So when it hits the ground, y is equal to zero. The projector hits the ground when zero is equal to y, which means this quadratic g, well, what is this equal to? g is 32 feet per second, secant squared theta 
over two v naught squared, 24 squared, x squared, plus tangent theta times x plus h, which is nine. So we want to find the value of x when y equals zero. That means we're solving a quadratic equation. Let's see. Um, 32, let me write this as 24 times 24. So eight goes into 32 four times and eight goes into 24 three times and four goes into 24 six times. So I get two times three times six. So this is 36 secant squared theta x squared plus tangent theta x plus nine equals zero. We have to solve this quadratic equation. X equals minus B minus tangent theta plus or minus the square root of V squared minus four AC A is 36 secant squared theta times C, which is nine. This is four times nine, that's 36. This is gonna be a 36 squared. So B squared minus four AC over two A, 2 times 36 secant squared theta. So x is minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared. Oops. Oh, this is in the denominator over 36. So b squared minus 4ac is 36 over 36. So this is tangent squared Oops, that's minus. So let me just do this again more carefully. I'll just write more neatly. So I have G secant squared theta over two V naught squared x squared plus tangent theta x plus h. And I want to know when is that equal to zero? My angle theta is something between zero and pi over two. So we're told that g is minus 32 feet per second squared. The initial velocity v naught is 24 feet per second. h the initial height is nine feet. So 32 minus 32 over two V naught squared, secant squared theta, X squared plus tangent theta X plus nine equals zero. So 32 over two, this is 16 over 24 squared. This is minus secant squared theta over 36 X squared plus tangent theta X plus nine equals zero. The solution is X equals minus B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus four AC, four times nine over 36 times minus, minus secant squared theta over B squared minus four AC over two A over 
minus 36 or minus minus two secant squared theta over 36. So x equals, so this is secant squared theta over 18, right? Minus secant squared theta over 18. And I have minus tangent theta plus or minus the square root of tangent squared theta plus secant squared theta. Tangent squared plus secant squared. What is that? Let's do a little bit of trig. Tangent squared theta plus secant squared theta. The tangent is the sine over the cosine. So that's sine squared over cosine squared theta plus one over cosine squared theta. That's equal to sine squared theta plus one over cosine squared theta. So the square root of all this, the square root of this is the square root of this, is the square root of sine squared theta plus one over cosine theta. So we get X is equal to minus tangent theta plus or minus one over cosine theta square root of sine squared theta plus one over minus one over 18 cosine squared theta. If I multiply through by minus 18 cosine squared theta, I get 18 cosine squared theta tangent theta plus or minus 18 cosine theta square root of sine squared theta plus one Oops, just one second, excuse me. No, oh, so continuing. So this is 18 cosines where tangent is sine over cosine. So the cosines, one of the cosines cancel. So I get 18 cosine theta sine theta plus or minus 18 cosine theta square root sine squared theta plus one. I can factor out an 18 cosine theta and I get sine theta plus or minus the square root sine squared theta plus one. So the point at which the pro projectile hits the ground x is a function of the angle theta and you want this to be as big as possible i'll choose the plus sign this is maximizes it when is this as big as possible so this is x is a function of theta well what the book says is this is why you need maple you compute dx d theta, that's not hard to do. But then to solve that equation for theta, you use maple or some other computer, al computer calculus, computer algebra program. And that's what does it. Hmm. Any homework problems anyone would like me to do? Huh. 
I'll do one or two, and if there's no interest, I will be done for the morning. So, Exercise, so this is in section 4.3, maybe number nine. You have the function g of x equals x squared minus 2x minus 8. Find the intervals where the function is increasing or decreasing. Well, what is the derivative? The derivative is 2x minus 2, or 2 times x minus 1. That equals 0 when x equals 1. So if x is greater than 1, g prime of x is positive, and the function is increasing. x is less than 1 g prime of x is less than zero. And the function is decreasing. And of course, g of x, this is x squared minus 2x. I can write this as plus 1 minus 9, which is x minus 1 squared minus 9. So this is just the parabola. which is equal to minus nine when x equals one. Parabola well, looks like this. And the minimum is at minus nine and it's increasing for x bigger than one and decreasing for x less than one. Suppose you look at number 17, that looks interesting. G of x is e to the minus x plus e to the three x. So the derivative is minus e to the minus x plus three e to the three x. Let's see. You could find where this is equal to zero. You could find the critical numbers. Let's just do that. So this is equal to zero when 3e to the 3x equals e to the minus x. 3e to the 4x equals one. <coughs> e to the 4x equals a third. So 4x is the log of a third or minus log three. So x is minus log three over four. And another way of writing this perhaps is g prime of x is if I factor out e to the minus x, e to the minus x times three e to the four x minus one. And this is greater than zero. e to the minus x is always positive. When three e to the four x is greater than one, or x is greater than minus log three over four, and it's less than zero, when x is log minus log three over four. So this function sort of looks like this and it's decreasing, <clears throat> then it's increasing and its relative minimum is when x is minus log three over four.
Let's look at number 35. Number 35, we have the function f of x is equal to five minus the absolute value of x minus five. Find the critical numbers, if any, find where the function is increasing and decreasing, find the relative extrema. So what can we say about the absolute value? The absolute value of x minus five is equal to x minus five as x is greater than or equal to five. And it's minus x minus five, which is five minus x when x is less than or equal to five. So f of x is equal to five minus x minus five or 10 minus x when x is greater than or equal to five and five minus five minus x or x when x is less than or equal to five. Where is the derivative equal to zero? So the derivative of 10 minus x is minus one. The derivative of x is one. That's never equal to zero. The only critical number is where the derivative doesn't exist at x equal to five. What does the graph of this function look like? When x is less than or equal to five, this is just the function, y equals x. When x is greater than or equal to five, it's 10 minus x. It's the sawtooth function with the corner here at five, five. f prime of x is minus one for all x greater than five. Well, decreasing from five to infinity. f prime of x equals plus one for x less than five, increasing from minus infinity to five. So there's one critical number x equal to five. So this is increasing on the open interval from minus infinity to five. Decreasing on the open interval from five to infinity. A relative max at five comma five. That's the description of this function. Hmm. Let's do one more, then I'll quit. So the last problem on the assignment is number 43, we have the function f of x, which is defined as follows. It's four minus x squared for x negative minus two x for x positive. What does this look like? When x is neg positive, it's the graph y equals minus 2x. When x is negative, it's the parabola 4 minus x squared. So 
So the function is defined at x equals zero, but there's no derivative there. For x less than zero, f prime of x is minus two x, which is positive. So the function is increasing for x less than zero. For x greater than zero, f prime of x is minus two. Sorry. Uh, yeah, minus two, which is negative. So the function is decreasing. And there's no relative maximum or minimum. Well, actually, I guess there is. The critical number is x equals zero, and there is a relative maximum at x equals zero. That's the story of the function. Any questions about this? No? Okay. Then I guess we're done for the morning. I mean, the actual lectures are all on YouTube and I'll post this problem session, but that will be it if there are no questions. Uh, we'll be having office hours uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday this week. If anyone has a question about any of the theoretical material or homework problems. Okay, bye all.